Hey, it's Teresa. Before we get started with this episode, I wanted to quickly tell you how Anchor by Spotify helps storytellers. Honestly, if I hadn't found Anchor, I'm not sure I would have even started this podcast. For the last year or so, I've recorded, edited, and shared more than 50 episodes on all the major platforms using Anchor. I use the same equipment that I record audiobooks on as a narrator, but you could record and edit a podcast right from your phone or computer using Anchor. They have everything you need. And best of all, Anchor by Spotify is totally free. So, if you know someone who has a story to tell, an idea to share, let them know they can download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Okay, let's get on with the episode. Thank you for listening. Desideratum is a Latin word. It means things that are desired as essential. This podcast celebrates storytelling as essential. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, showcasing the talents of my author and narrator friends. I hope you'll hear an artist you love or find your next favorite wordsmith. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being with me. Oh, certainly. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so I this is sort of surreal in some ways because I'm interviewing an author. Yeah. And the novel is about interviewing an author. <laughs> in a full circle. Yeah, or at least that your format, you've told this story in the format of an interview. Mm-hmm. So I thought I would start with that. Why did you choose this format for this story? As happens with my writing a lot, a character just invaded my head. And I'm one of those guys who, when I lay down, I fall asleep. I don't even have to be tired. If I lay down, I fall asleep. <laughs> That's nice. But one night I was laying, just tossing and turning and thinking about this character and I couldn't get him out of my head. He wasn't letting me go to sleep. Uh, so I got up at three in the morning and just started jotting notes down. But I didn't really know what the story was. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll do something that I recommend to my uh, editing clients or I do a writing coach and writing instructor. And uh, so students and clients of mine, I, I recommend that they interview their characters as a way to get to know their characters. You don't necessarily use the interview in the book, but it just helps you as a writer get to know that character. And so I started doing that. Okay, so this interviewer of characters is author Robert Grindstaff. I love that image of a fictional character waking him up, not letting him sleep, like a nocturnal muse. It turns out Rob has a lengthy resume of interview skills in journalism and media. The newspaper biz took him from small-town Wisconsin to Washington, D.C., and he describes himself as a small-town kid who's as comfortable in Tokyo as he is in Tuna, Texas. We're talking about his latest novel, Slade. When the character first started talking to you, did you know that he'd been through this very traumatic accident? Was that how you first started hearing him? I think that's how he came to me. And I needed to know, you know, how he got there and uh, and then what he was doing with that. I knew that there was this following and I didn't know how that happened. And I had to interview him to find out. So he's been through this horrible accident and he writes something that's inspirational. And that's kind of the launching point for where things go awry, right? <laughs> he ends up with a following. He ends up inspiring others. Mm -hmm. He has an, an enormous following. And then he has no control, though, over how people are responding to him, right? Yeah. Like that gets to the essence of it to me is that 
bad things happen and it's not, it's not his, under his directive maybe. Yeah. And so this idea that we, that we don't have control over other people's behavior is also kind of part of the, the thread of story. It's extremely compelling, this kind of peeling back the layers in an interview format, because some people see him as having this extreme influence and he is responsible. He, he should be held responsible for his influence, right? Mm -hmm. Was there anything real life that inspired that? Like how, how did you get to this idea of, of that kind of influence and power? Um, it kind of came to me as you know a reluctant messiah um, and then because of events turned his back on all of that and wanted nothing to do with it and it just you know kind of went on on its own real life i don't know if there was a real life inspiration um combinations of lots of real life people out there whether they're you know self-help gurus or um you know pastors or politicians that you know people gravitate to and follow and then put up on a pedestal and you know almost to the point of worshiping a person putting their faith in a another person and the the perils of that come to light in this story mm -hmm. and i think you know it's that idea of like i put something out there and it's a ripple effect yes like everything we do ripples out from us and does impact others mm -hmm. the the butterfly effect right 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 you this is a story about that in so many ways yes it's kind of hard to talk about this story without giving it away <laughs> you know how we how we can and cannot control things that happen to us or from us is one of your main themes yeah i i think that's that's one of my main themes in life, I think. And it's one of, you know, therefore it's one of Slade's main themes is, you know, you have to make the right decisions as best you can. Um, live your life the way you're meant to live it and that you should live it as best you can. Um, and you, you know, can't be responsible for what other people do. You may have to react to it, but you're not responsible for them. And you're responsible for your choices. And sometimes we make bad ones. Yeah. You have him becoming, I think you use the phrase like a false messiah almost, you know, people turn to him for answers. And, you, and then you have him married to someone who is a very devout Christian mm -hmm. and very strong in her faith. And you don't, you don't really have them argue about that at all, though. They just sort of accept each other and accept each other's beliefs. Yes. Like, it was hard for me to figure out, and this is a compliment. Okay. Like, I think sometimes the author's voice, like you were saying, there's bits of me in this. I think sometimes that's really clear and easy to hear. But in this story, the way that you balance these characters' belief systems, I wasn't sure where you were in it. <laughs> you did such a great job of balancing them. Well, good, good. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't trying to insert myself in there or, you know, have a message that I wanted to get across personally. I just wanted to show life and different people having different thoughts and ideas and approaches to life. I kept coming back to this note to myself about this being about seeking, having questions, seeking answers. But you don't really, you don't have an agenda in here about providing an answer. No, no. Um, you know, and people have pointed out that I don't even have an agenda of, you know, is Slade a good character or a bad character? Yes. Different secondary characters had different ideas uh, about Slade, and I let them all have their voice. You know, I think it's to the reader to decide, was Slade a good person or was he the manipulative con artist that some claimed he was? Yes. And maybe... Maybe that is what appealed to me most about this, the format and the way that you just described how you left it to the reader, because that is good journalism. <laughs> yeah, the, it was just kind of objective journalism. Yeah, you took a journalist's eye to a very fictionalized um, novel, obviously, but there's something really satisfying about that to me um, as a former journalist. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's break in here and listen to a few minutes of the audiobook. So you can hear for yourself this interview format and this character at the heart of it all, Slade. The narrator, Timothy G. Little, matches Rob in the fun facts category. Between his corporate jobs and his literary life, Tim has lived in Turkey, Greece, Costa Rica, Spain, and Italy. And he's narrated about 50 titles with his resonant, mesmerizing tone. This is Slade, written by Robert Grindstaff, narrated by Timothy G. Little. Interviewer, tell me about the accident. What do you remember from that night? Slade, I died, man. I died in that moment nearly 30 years ago, but nothing in life is an accident. Interviewer, you're sitting here conversing with me now. You're very much alive. Slade, more alive than ever. More alive than before that night. Before, I wasn't living the life I was meant to live. I was selfish and doing things that brought me pleasure, but with no purpose. I knew that, too. I knew I wasn't living. Something was missing. Some intention to life. But I was young, you know, and I figured I'd settle down and live the way I knew I should once I sowed my wild oats. Sowing wild oats. That's a cliché, isn't it? My agent is always pointing out when I use clichés. Apparently, I like them. When I was 19, I thought I could start being a responsible adult when I was 21. At 21, I thought 25 sounded like a good age to mature. Then 30 sounded like the right age to become a grown-up. But at 29, life ended. I knew my life was ending. When something like that happens, you know you're dead, and you see. Interviewer Your life flashed before your eyes? Slade Now that's a cliché. Life didn't so much flash before my eyes, but I could suddenly see it all clearly. The life I was intended to live. The life I'd avoided, procrastinated, put off until I was older. And now I would never be older. I'd miss that opportunity. We're all given one chance at life, and we don't think it's going to end suddenly like that. And when it ends, you see how it was meant to be. It's like getting to the station just as your train pulls out, and it's the last one. You missed it. There's nothing you can do. Nothing to be done. And so I died. Interviewer. Are you saying the doctors revived you in the hospital? Slade. I'm saying the old me died. I was reborn the moment of the crash. The doctors, bless them, did the best they could with what they had to work with. I was fully aware the whole time. Fourteen days in a coma, and I heard every word and saw every person who walked into my room. Once I was conscious, the doctor sat beside my bed to update me on my situation. I interrupted and recited to him everything he was going to say. I already knew. I'd heard it all before. And I smiled and patted his hand and told him everything was going to be fine. He started crying, uncontrollable sobbing. It's hard to witness a grown man weep like that. The new me was conceived even before they got me to the hospital. The surgeries, the months in the hospital, and recovery were all equivalent to childbirth. The new me being born. Interviewer, do you ever ask why? Slade, These things just happen. One person dies, someone else survives, another is reborn. Interviewer. God's plan or random chance? Slade. Is there a difference?
but I did feel like uh, this was a legit interviewer. Yeah. Matter of fact, there's um there's a place where you talk about, I think in the very beginning, Slade says, I don't take notes. Right. Don't write things down. Um, I would rather you just be here in the moment with me instead of taking notes. And I thought, oh, that would be very challenging mm-hmm. for someone who is a professional interviewer to put their pen down and try to just absorb everything that was being said. Yeah. And that is all based on a real life event. When I was in college, I uh, was on the campus, you know, the college newspaper, and we had Art Garfunkel coming to campus, you know, like about six o'clock on a Sunday morning in the chapel building. Really? With the college chorale, the university chorale, to record background vocals for a song that he was putting on an album he was working on. This was in the 1970s. And nobody was supposed to know he was even on campus. They had sworn the chorale members to secrecy. And well, you know, I was a journalist even way back then. I had connections and found out that Art Garfunkel was coming. And so I showed up at six o'clock in the morning also and hung out and got word to him that I was with the college newspaper. And when he was done doing this recording, could I interview him? Um, and he graciously agreed and he walked outside the chapel afterwards. We're standing in the parking lot and I pulled out my notebook and he said, put that away. He said, practice your memorization skills. Just talk to me, ask me questions. When we're done talking, you go sit down and write your story. And that has always, always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And so I used Art Garfunkel's advice in writing this book. I love that. I love that story. That's amazing. You know, I think I might have been 17 years old at the time, and this was Art Garfunkel, and I said, sure, I'll put the notepad away. <laughs> well, so some of the some of the quotes that you start with feel like they come right off of, like, the Instagram inspirational quote page. <laughs> right? Yeah. So are they all you, or... Like one is, um, oh, let me find one. If you live the life you want, this is from chapter one. Okay. If you live the life you want, you will love the life you live. The more you love your life, the easier it is to accept your eventual death. Like we talk about packing a lot, a lot of wow per word mm-hmm. in journalism. You have to get the most in per word. That is succinct, but broad (laughs) yeah and that's uh that was all slayed they came from the character it wasn't me coming up with a quote and then figuring out how i can make the character say that i never find that works for me in writing fiction so that makes sense to me that that it feels like the character and so you're just letting the character speak through you just letting the character speak and that's the advice i finally boiled down to writers who were having trouble writing natural dialogue was that what turns out they were doing is they were writing a script of what they wanted the character to say and then handing the page to the character and saying here read this Mm. just let the character talk don't try to tell them what to say it doesn't come out right and so back i think your original question was you know these quotes coming from me um, probably a lot of them did subconsciously. Uh, I think everything probably is filtered through the subconscious uh, when we're writing, but the quotes came from the characters. I heard the character say it and I wrote it down. Yes. Well, yeah, one of the quotes is that fiction contains more truth than nonfiction, or at least it's easier to digest. <laughs> yeah. And I did think you, in this storytelling, and it is a story. It's a compelling story with a that keeps you as a reader interested in what's going to happen next. One of the things I really liked is that you, the interviewer in this story who shares your name, you ask at one point, is there anything I didn't ask? And that is one of my favorite questions, actually. Yes, mine too. Whenever you're interviewing something, somebody, there's always something they want to tell you. And they're waiting for you to ask the right question. Yes. And if you don't and you close the interview and leave, they feel disappointed. They didn't get a chance to say the main thing they wanted to say. 
Yes. And you don't even know as the person asking the questions, you don't even know what you've missed because you didn't ask that question. Yeah. So that's my question for you now. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you thought was really important to talk about today? <laughs> um, you know, there is actually the one question that has come up. I've had a couple of readers ask about it. Did Slade manipulate his wife, Annie, you know, into leaving Hollywood, marrying him, or, or did Annie manipulate Slade? Yeah. And so, you know, she was there from the beginning. Or was it just this, you know, really wonderful symbiotic relationship between the two of them and then nobody was manipulating anybody? And somebody asked why I didn't answer that question. And the answer is, I don't know. I, I, I just honestly, you know, they said, well, you wrote the book, you know. And I'm, no, I don't. <laughs> they didn't tell me. Yes, there. I loved actually how many how many unanswered questions there really are, because that also, to me, just feels like life. Mm -hmm. You know, when things are really tied up super neatly, I think there's some satisfaction there as a reader, but I loved that there were no definitive answers about uh, who's responsible mm -hmm. or who's to blame or who's to give credit to. Yeah. But that was like, what we were talking about a minute ago about journalism, you know, I just think you just sort of presented it because it was like, you allowed us to figure something out. You didn't have to spell it out, but you allowed us to figure something out. And that felt like what a lot of this book was is that you put information out there and you allow the reader to figure it out. The last question I usually ask has to do with the name of the podcast being Desideratum. Mm -hmm which is about essential things. And so this book really, the way that you even start each chapter kind of tells me at least what this character thought were essential things. But if someone were to ask you, what do you think is essential? How do you respond? Um, I know what the essential things are to me. What um, I struggle with day to day is, you know, living up to those standards. But the essential things to me are faith, family. That's pretty much everything that's uh, of critical importance to me. I also look back and look at all the times I've, I've failed to live up to my, my own expectations uh, in those two key areas. There is a lot in this story about faith and family. Do you think that that weaves its way through all of your storytelling? Yes, it does. It does seem to do that. Family, faith in the face of conflict and challenges and overcoming something traumatic um, is, is probably the core, uh, at, at the core of every novel I've written. You can find every novel Rob's written on his website. I'll put a link in the show notes. I'd like to thank Rob and his publisher, Evolved Publishing. And as always, thank you for listening.